Welcome to Limitless, the blind beginnings podcast where seeing things differently inspires limitless possibilities. This podcast is being brought to you by Blind Beginnings, an organization based in Vancouver, Canada, that supports children and youth who are blind or partially sighted, along with their families. Limitless was created in order to inform, educate, entertain, and share stories from within the blind and partially sighted community, in order to show the world that the opportunities for those who are blind or partially sighted are truly limitless. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to your host, the executive director and founder of Blind Beginnings, Sean Marcelet. Welcome back to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast. I'm your host, Sean Marcelet. Thank you for joining us again this week. We have another fabulous episode. I would like to introduce my co-host today, Jill. Welcome back to the podcast, Jill. Hi, thank you. So today we're talking about a cool program that takes place at Vancouver Community College, the King Edward Campus, a visual impairment program. And we have one of the instructors who also happens to be a great friend of mine, Monty, coming back to the podcast. Welcome back, Monty. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah. I don't remember what episode it was, but if any of our listeners wanted to hear Monty's last episode, we were talking about um, white canes and some of the trials and tribulations that we have had with those. So probably what, eight, eight episodes ago or five to eight or something like that. It wasn't yeah. Yeah. Too not too long, long ago. ago. Exactly. So Monty, why don't you tell us what is this visual impairment program? Okay, so really what it is, is it's uh, an opportunity for students to learn how to use uh, technology with assistive technology. Um, so it's, it's really taking mainstream applications. Uh, so for example, we could take the Microsoft Office suite of applications. So Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Outlook, and I'm probably missing one, aren't I? Um, also web browsers such as Google Chrome. So sort of mainstream applications and how to use them when you're blind or partially sighted. So that could be with a screen reader, it could be with screen magnification. Um, and with a screen reader, there's a range of screen readers. So you could learn how to use it with uh, JAWS or NVDA, or we could learn how to use the Mac with uh, VoiceOver and Mac OS or iOS. And it's, it's really just teaching people how to access mainstream technology through assistive technology. Um, in addition to that, we also teach Braille, so giving access to information and uh, folks can learn how to read Braille uh, you know, using paper and or refreshable Braille. We sort of do a little bit of both and teach people how to use uncontracted and contracted Braille. So um, we do some other things here and there as well. Uh, so we have a lot of students that are uh, from abroad. Uh, they may be here under the refugee programs of Canada. So they may be here quite suddenly and they don't know how to speak English. So sometimes we'll also throw in some literacy uh, to help them uh, with the courses that involve Braille or assistive technology. That's awesome. Um, Jill, you were a student, so maybe you can explain sort of how you found your way to the program and what you were taking when you were there. Yeah, so it kind of goes back to when I lost my sight when I was 15, um, because I was in high school, just started high school, and previously to the vision loss, I didn't use any braille or like assistive technology all that much. So when I lost my sight, we were kind of stuck. Like my vision teacher was more focused on O and M and life skills, and wasn't a very big tech guy whatsoever. So I had nobody to teach me the technology that much. Um, and then I kind of forget how I heard about the program. Actually, I think it was my vision teacher who had some contacts down in the Lower Mainland who um, connect, like, told him about the vision pair program, and he kind of called it like a finishing school for blind students in a way is kind of how he jokingly referred to it. So it was kind of to fi like, you know, finalize a little bit like on the Braille or the accessible technology that he wasn't able to teach us as much. And because I didn't have the opportunity to learn any of that in the last three years of high school, I felt that it was something I really needed to learn um, before I went 
on to like post-secondary university. So I, I think I just applied and I got in right away because I was planning on moving down here for university anyways, but VCC and the visually impaired program seemed like a good kind of transition from small town to big city and also to learn uh, accessible or adaptive technology. And I also thought Braille would be beneficial. Um, so I went to VCC in the visually impaired program for a year um, and I learned, I did Braille. So I did un uncontracted then contracted Braille um, and I believe I also at the time was using uh, PC. So I learned more about like Microsoft Word and PowerPoint, I believe it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Monty taught me all of that. So Monty and I, we worked a lot together. So, and I was there, I think every day throughout the week, um, for about, we, it was kind of nice cause we had the option. Uh, I mean, it was five years ago, so it might change a little bit from when I was there. But we had the option of when we wanted to go throughout the week and throughout like the times throughout the day. But I, because I knew that Braille was <laughs> fairly lengthy to learn if you didn't really know any of it. Um, and so I just wanted to go and learn as much as I could in that year that I had kind of planned out to go. So yeah, that's kind of how I ended up being in the program for that year. That's interesting because uh, I actually also attended the visual impairment program, although. <clears throat> many years ago. <laughs> I don't want to say how many, um, but I had tried, to, well, because I have a degenerative eye condition in high school, I was able to read print, but after graduating, I was kind of in this transition period of like, not really always able to read print um, sometimes. And it was, you know, the beginning of speech programs being better and I don't know anyway so I went to the program for one semester right after high school I was learning how to use word perfect <laughs> which is like what word was before word was word um for, and then DOS. I, for DOS don't believe that part out <laughs> and and I also learned braille at that time mm. because I hadn't learned braille when I was growing up and I just kind of was able to work through it at my own pace and I crammed it all into one month, which is, oh, wow. yeah, but I'm not a great braille reader to Fair. this day. <laughs> so I think that was not the best way to learn braille, but uh, it's just funny that we both had that experience. Yeah. Kind of doing very that. similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Monty, how the heck does this work? Like you've got lots of different students and everybody's learning a different thing and everyone's using a different assistive technology and how, like, can you kind of explain yeah. how this works? So it can be quite complicated um, because I actually went through it in preparation for today. And I believe we offer somewhere in the neighborhood of 28 courses. And uh, I can sometimes, now it depends. And right now, since we're just coming out of the you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, our numbers aren't as high as they were, but I think the most students I've ever had in my class has been 14. And that may not sound like a lot if you've just been to a university lecture with 500 people, but if you can think that those 14 people may be taking up to three courses and they could be any one of those 28 courses and they could be at any point in that course. So our courses last for four months. And so even if everybody in my class is taking the same course, it's extremely unlikely that they're going to be on the same lesson or the same assignment. Uh, so the way I explain it to people is it, it can be a lot of juggling um, because I need to make sure that people aren't idle. So I need to make sure that they're learning, that they feel like they're you know, getting their money's worth, that they're, they're learning everything they want to learn. So I can't just sit there and say, Oh, I can't teach you until tomorrow. I have to uh, sort of prioritize people and keep them all busy and learning. And, and um, I like that too, because that keeps me busy. Um, and um, so the knowledge is part of it. Like I've been an assistive technology user for almost a little bit longer than you when you first attended VCC, in fact. <laughs> um, but I've, you know, just because you know how to use it, doesn't mean that you're good at juggling <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, or teaching for that matter. So um, my the biggest challenge at first wasn't the assistive technology because I you know know that pretty well, but it was 
how do I keep this floating and moving forward? And uh, we have two classrooms that run like that at the same time. So um, there can be an awful lot going on at one time. So really, um, I just try to keep on top of people, uh, make sure that they're organized, make sure that I'm organized, and make sure that everybody sort of follows the game plan. And if, if that happens, uh, which which works out most of the time, but obviously there's there's spanners or wrenches in the works quite a lot, like something will come up and you need to go work with that. So, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, like I said, be good at juggling, be flexible. Hopefully students are, can be pretty flexible as well. Um, and uh, yeah, if, uh, if it all goes well, then it, then it goes well. And I think it does for the most part, we, we usually get uh, good evaluations. So. So Jill, maybe you can talk about like, you got to work, you're working at your own pace. You're kind of working through lessons. Like, was it hard to be motivated to kind of, and it, it sounds like there was a lot of flexibility of show up when you want, leave when you yeah. want, like you're treated like an adult, but you're going to get into it. What you're going to get out of it, what you put into it. Right. So exactly. You, how was that for you? Well, it was funny. Cause I went like from, uh, I went to the college at my hometown for a year before I went to BCC. Um, so I kind of had that little bit of transition from high school to college where like, you know, you go to a class and you listen to a lecture, but it's, there's no, like in high school, you had an like, EA kind of on top of you, like make sure you got your homework done or to help you with whatever you needed. But in college, it's kind of like up to you for, for the most part to ask for help and, you know, keep on track of your assignments and everything. So that kind of felt the same way to me um, from the college in my hometown to VCC, like that transition didn't seem quite as hard as I expected. Um, but again, what I thought was most like, maybe not, I don't want to say challenging, but more like something to get used to was, oh, I can pick and choose when I go. <laughs> like it's yeah. not a set schedule. It's like, if I don't want to get up Monday morning and go, I can go in the afternoon or not go at all that day. And like, I'm not that kind of person. So like I wanted to go there every day and learn as much as I could for that year because it was my goal was to be there for a year and then move on to university and get my actual degree um so I, I was pretty determined to go every day and learn as much as I could but I think it was like in college like a traditional like, college course you have an instructor at the front of the room teaching or giving a lecture as we're at VCC it's like um you know like they well, like Monty, because <laughs> you were my instructor, um, you're kind of like, we are at our own desks. And like, if I ever had a question, I'd be like, hey, Monty, can you come help me with this? But it wasn't like where he was up in front of the classroom and we're all like facing him and he's teaching us each mm -hmm. lesson one by one. So it was kind of like, that was a bit of a thing to get used to. It's like, oh, so like I can just move on and I don't have to worry about like waiting for other people to catch up or like if I'm behind, like you don't feel bad because someone's waiting for you. Mm -hmm. You just kind of go at your own pace, which was actually really nice like I'm not a big technology person accessible technology is something I know I needed to learn but it wasn't like my main interest but it was something like it was more like I need to know this not that I actually want to in a way so like they take like learning word and powerpoint and like this will be good and useful in the future but right now it's like oh I could just you know go scroll Facebook if I want it or something and no one's gonna get like, give me trouble but like so that was a little bit of an adjustment is just a work at my own pace and mm -hmm. not have someone like kind of giving me a lesson or a lecture like standing in front of me except for when we did braille that was more like Monty and I would do one-on-one -on -one with braille because um with the accessible technology I knew a little bit but I needed to know more as we're braille I was like pretty much starting from scratch so that mm -hmm. was more one-on-one -on -one. um and I can't remember if we did braille every day I, I don't remember yeah so what I remember that? with you I think mm -hmm. you sort of split the day up into two halves you would do right. sort of whatever you're doing with assistive technology mm -hmm. um uh, you know whatever course that was or two courses sometimes i think you maybe had three courses even i think so um, yeah and then braille was usually i think the afternoon because right i remember internally i was thinking i was we, we got to be getting to 315. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it's just as the day goes on. Well, no, but when you're reading Braille, it's it's tough, right? At yeah. the best of times. And when it's at the end of the day. Um, mm. But Jill was, Jill was doing really well in it. And what I should also add, I don't think I explained this, and, and Jill touched on it too, is so 
we have a, a pretty big classroom. It's a lab and there's computers that go all the way around the edges. And then there's tables in the middle where people can read braille or use their laptops, but there's no privacy. So if I'm sitting four feet away from Jill working with another student, okay, she has headphones on, but they're probably not noise canceling headphones. And she easily could get distracted by whatever I'm doing with a student six feet away. Right. And there's nothing any of us can do about it. So, you know, we all try to be respectful, but it's hard not to make noise if you're pounding away on a Perkins Brailler and <laughs> there's an Android tablet over here and an iPad over there and somebody's using NVDA over here. And like we do use, head, you know, headphones, but it's not always perfect. Okay. I have questions, two questions, one for each of you actually, but Monty, what is it like when, cause you're totally blind, you're using, you use a screen reader, but sometimes you have to work with a student who's using, um, magnification software. Mm -hmm. So is that ever a problem? It's, it's not ideal if I were to be completely honest, but the way I get around that is I make sure I know whatever application I'm teaching, um, inside and out. So just because I'm not a Zoom text user doesn't mean that I can't memorize all of the commands and, you know, figure out how to use it um, to help as best as I can. And the good news is for, for things like that, so whether you're using a screen magnifier or a screen reader, um, they all do things a little bit differently, but they ultimately get to the same destination and they all kind of use similar techniques. So uh, if I'm teaching something that is involving large print, uh, I can usually, uh, you know, teach a lesson okay. Like occasionally if something went horribly wrong and the student's not able to articulate and I'm not able to sort of solve the problem, I'll, I'll, I'll look for sighted assistance. But I can probably count on one or two fingers how many times I've needed to do that, you know, since right. I've been here. So um, it it can be a challenge, but I think if you sort of know, know your topic and know how things work, then, you know, that, that gives me a bit of an advantage and, uh, I just make sure I keep up with everything as best as possible. And Jill, how is it having a, an instructor that's also blind? Well, yeah, it was definitely like the first time for me, because I grew up like in a really small town where I think I was one of like two younger visually impaired people um so, and as were some of my friends in the lower mainland their like I don't know, vision teachers might have already been visually impaired um so i had never like, experienced that and i hadn't really been around a lot of visually impaired people really until i moved down here and really went to vcc and joined blind beginnings um so it was kind of like i don't know if like the word culture shock is a little bit like it's not the right term but it's kind of felt that way because like I like people would say hi to me I'm like oh hi and they're like who's that I'm like who are you like I don't you know like I don't remember <laughs> to like say who's my my this is my name or like if I was walking past someone in the hallway like coming up on your what like your left or your right like it was kind of a different experience for me that way but like having an instructor like because I'm pretty sure like I remember having a basic understanding of how to use like the Perkins Brailler and kind of how Braille worked but it was more like a we kind of like just halfway did it in high school like I think I learned like the alphabet and that was it so like the way that Monty had showed me he like if I he usually I think from what I remember he would kind of like describe something and then if I didn't catch on then like we do like hand over hand method um which was worked for me and like it wasn't quite as like sh like surprising or like it didn't seem as unfamiliar as I expected like I caught on to that pretty quick um but it was also nice to like because I saw Monty every day for like well a year give or take right so it was nice to like to be around someone who kind of understood how to use it and like i had friends who tried to teach me how to, to use accessible technology and like sometimes they have like, a little bit of a condescending tone or something where like i won't learn from you if you're condescending mm -hmm. to me like it just it, it makes me shut down like i'm not interested anymore but like monty never did that and he was really like really patient Cause like, I'm not a tech person, like I said, so, and he is, but so, but he understood that I wasn't. So he was like really patient with me. And if I was confused or didn't catch on after like him explaining it like three times, he'd still be patient and like not get frustrated. He just took his time and always found like a different way to describe it or explain it. So that was, made it really easy for me. And I think it, like, cause he had worked with other visually impaired people 
and who had different levels of vision, different levels of like comprehension. So like, he like, seems to have like a really good way to to adapt to different visual impairments and different levels of understanding. So mm -hmm. that made it really easy for me. And then just to, like, to have someone, well, actually, Monty was one of the first people I ever met who had the same eye condition. So that was really exciting for me because I had never met anyone with my eye condition or our eye condition. <laughs> um, so I was pretty pumped about that. And then just like, like, like the, he helped me figure out like even more than just the accessible technology or braille, like he had explained some of the transit, for example, or like he, if I couldn't figure out how to get from the classrooms to like the elevator or I think it was like the cafeteria, he like described it or showed me once or something. So mm -hmm. it kind of felt like it went beyond that. Um, and we've like kept in touch over the years and stuff too. So it's been, I don't know, it was really nice to like, have someone who could relate to a lot of things I was going through. So, yeah. I was totally smiling when you were saying how patient he was if you didn't get it right away, because Monty has taught me a lot mm. about technology over the years, just as a friend. And I am a little tech challenged myself <laughs> and he's had to be very patient with me too. So. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's so funny. But it's, it's just needed. Like I can't learn from someone who is going to get frustrated and like, or get like, mm -hmm. come on, I told you this like twice already. I'm like, doesn't yeah. mean I'm going to get it. Like, I don't, I won't learn from you. So Monty, you're a very good instructor. Though. Yeah. Well, the, I think, you know, first of all, it, it helps if you have somebody that's teaching you from your perspective, because mm -hmm. that helps, right? Like, cause then they're hopefully teaching you the right things and using the right sort of concepts and, and ways of describing it. I mean, for me, it's kind of easy because I just think, well, how would I like to learn or how would I need to learn? So that helps. Um, but it, it's interesting also what you were saying, Jill, and I, I, I don't know if everybody is like this um, when they're teaching, but I also find that, you know, you can't learn 100% of the time. So, so sometimes it's important to chat about other things or to have a quick break. And, and if we can learn about other things, that's nothing to do with what you're, you're doing. That gives you a break. And it, you know, for talking like that would spontaneously happen in the classroom. If you remember, like sometimes we'd be talking <laughs> yeah. about, Hey, does anybody know how to get here on the bus? Or like, does anybody like it, it happened? And I'd, I don't think I'd let that go on all day, but it's important to have that go on for a little while because we all learn from each other. And uh, if it's something useful or relevant, and uh, th then you're more likely to want to learn it as well, right? So, mm -hmm. are all the instructors in the visual impairment program blind? Uh, no. So right now we ha there's three of us, and uh, two of us are totally blind, and one of us is totally sighted. Okay. And students, is it typical that they come for a year or how, how long? What, what's right. the commitment? So, uh, interesting answer here. So we have different types of students. We have some students like Jill who see us as a, a way of learning what they need to learn so that they can move on to the next challenge. Uh, or we have students that come here at a certain point in time and maybe that was 20 years ago and they're still here okay. so um some people like have three or four courses they need to take and they're out of here other students like to go through our entire catalog um, i think it really just depends on what your goals are and you know what you have going on in life and what your aspirations are so some people are you know i don't think that's unique to here like there are some people that are just lifelong learners right mm -hmm. and uh there's no exception here and i should also say that our students range in age. The youngest I've had was 17 and the oldest I've had was 96. Oh, cool. Well, and that's I'd imagine, yeah, I'd imagine, um, would you say the majority are people who've lost their vision as adults? Yeah. So I think that's probably changed over the years. So I think, uh, so this program has been going since the early eighties. And I think probably what happened back then was since computing and assistive technology was a little more niche in that you didn't really learn it as much in school. So if you needed to use it, like blind and partially sighted people needed to, to access information, even though it was a little bit different accessing information then than it is now, I think everybody needed to come here, whether you were young or old or, or otherwise. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think now the demographic is shifting a little bit because people are learning how to use this stuff in school. So now 
what we're sort of noticing, or I'm anecdotally noticing, is that there aren't as many people coming fresh out of high school, but there are people that are coming, um, you know, once a couple of version changes happen or things change enough that they need a refresher. So I'm sort of noticing that there are some young people that are coming in still, um, but you're quite right. I would say our, our uh, sort of biggest groups these days are, are people that are sort of losing their sight later on in life, whether that's, um, you know, a degenerative eye condition or something that happened quite suddenly, um, or, you know, as you become older, sometimes eyesight becomes a little worse. And sometimes you move into that, uh, you know, legally blind or partially sighted category, and you need to learn different ways of, of accessing information. So, uh, you know, we, we really have people that, that are, are across the range. Um, but yeah, I would say mostly people that are, that are older, that are losing their sight. So how did COVID impact the program? Well, it was very sudden. <laughs> I remember what hearing about the NBA shutting down, I think like on a Thursday or a Friday and uh, had a nice peaceful weekend. And then I came in on the Monday and everything started to pile on and it just looked like things were uh, going to change and change quickly. So I got myself a USB stick, copied everybody's courses onto it as quickly as I could <laughs> and uh, got out of Dodge that day. I think it was like March 16th or something. And then we sort of had a meeting the next day to say like, what on earth do we do? Because, you know, we plan for fire drills, we plan for earthquakes and such. Um, but honestly, I don't think we, as a department, we hadn't really planned for a pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we had to sort of make it up as we, as we went. Um, but what we had to do very quickly is we had to shift into a, a distance learning model and we had to be flexible because if you think about how distance learning works at its core is you need that delivery platform. So if you remember at first, like Zoom started to be pretty big, but then some people weren't using Zoom for various reasons. And some people were using, you know, Microsoft solutions. Some people were using Skype. Some people were using FaceTime, like it was all over the map. Mm -hmm. um, and we were no exception because really, if you think about teaching somebody how to use technology, well, maybe they don't know how to use their phone yet, or maybe yeah. they don't know how to use a computer yet. So how are they going to learn how to use Zoom or, or what have you? You so, hadn't gotten to that module. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, uh, we haven't gotten there till next week. But uh, so so what ended up happening is we had had to just be really flexible. And and there was no nobody telling me how to teach or, or what to do. And I or any of the other instructors here. So I think we all just figured out. And my, my thing was, is I, I talked to the students and said, look, here, here's where we're at. Here's what we have left. Here's where you are now. Uh, what's the best way that I can help you get to this destination? And if that meant that we had to just speak on the phone, then that's what we did. If you knew how to use email and we could communicate that way, then we would do that. Um, I would, uh, you know, I didn't have my own sort of work phone. So everybody just phoned my cell phone. And uh, that was interesting because sometimes I'd get calls on the weekend and things like that, um, that I'd ignore, by the way, for the most part. <laughs> Not um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But um, so we just had to be really, really flexible. And, um, it, you know, at the very beginning, I mean, I'll give you an example of a dilemma, right? So uh, most of the courses we teach, or at least the ones that I teach are assistive technology. So a lot of that could take place remotely. But if you think about students who are learning Braille, well, that's a little mm -hmm. more difficult mm -hmm. because A, you need physical Braille, at least when you're starting off, physical Braille is, is the easiest to learn on. And so you need access to that. You need someone probably sitting there showing you, right? So at first, I remember we were like, uh, well, we're going to have to, uh, you know, mail out the, the Braille homework and the Braille material to the student. And at the very beginning, if you remember of the pandemic, there was some question as to how COVID spread and, yeah. and touching Braille at the time maybe wasn't necessarily a good idea if it came from elsewhere, right? So we couldn't really ship it out to people at first. Um, so that was difficult. I think we had to make the difficult decision for any new students to say, like, hold off learning Braille until we can get back in person or until 
things get to a point where we've sorted everything out. Um, if you're midway through, we'll do our best to support you uh, and help you not forget it. Because remember too, at first we didn't know how long it was going to last. Like mm -hmm. we didn't know if we we're all going to be back in April or you know what have you. Little did we know, right? Mm -hmm. But um, so I think we just we were just you know very flexible with that. With um, so a bunch of people only knew A through J for two years. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I didn't. I didn't have any Braille students at the time, so I don't really know, you know, how that worked. Um, but what I do know, what what became a little bit tricky is, so sometimes we would have to um, make sure that students had access to computers. So we'd have to sometimes loan them a, a you know, a laptop because they maybe were using the computers here in the lab and they wouldn't be expected to have anything at home. Now, most people did, right? But I, I think I had one or two that didn't. Uh, maybe they had an old version of JAWS or NVDA at home, or they're using an old iPhone, you know, with iOS 11. And we're now, you know, at the time, let's say we we're learning iOS 14 or something. And so things were a little bit different. And so we'd ha have to do our best to, uh, you know, I wasn't going to penalize somebody for only having, you know, JAWS 7, 17 installed on their computer. You know what I mean? I did my best to, to make it work with whatever they had. And luckily, I've, I'm, I'm old enough and uh, ugly enough to know a bunch of uh, versions of everything. So I was able to adapt more or less. But it was, yeah, it was, it was tricky. So are, is everything, has, did, has, have things changed, I guess, is what I'm asking. Um, now that COVID is sort of whatever it is, I don't even know if, I don't know what to say. If it's like... Well, yes, we're not, it's not over until it's mm -hmm. over, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and I, I get the impression that while we're in a, a good patch, it could flare up at any moment, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what we're doing now is um, we have uh, basically created a hybrid model. So we have what we call face-to-face -face or in-person teaching that takes place on Mondays and Wednesdays. And then on Tuesday, Thursdays, and Fridays, we teach at a distance. So we don't mix the two. So if you are a, a, a sorry, we can mix the two in that somebody can be a distance learner and an in-person learner. So they could come, they could learn every day of the week if they wish, okay. but they can only come in person on Monday and Wednesdays, and they can only learn at home on Tuesday and Thursdays. I don't mix the two because if you think juggling a bunch of people in a classroom or distance learning is hard enough. Think about if, if everybody's in different locations, uh, mm -hmm. it just wouldn't work. So we have to sort of segregate the days that way, but um, we keep the same hours. So we, you know, we go from eight 45 to three 15 uh, every day of the week. It's just some take place at a distance and some take place face to face. And if people wish to mix the two together, they're definitely allowed to do that. And yeah, we've, we've, for now, we've kept that. I think we're going to have another meeting at the end of the year or prior to September to make sure that that's the model we still want to follow. But uh, it seems to be working pretty well because there are some students that seem to prefer working flexibly at a distance, uh, whether it's at home or I just had a student uh, that uh, was uh, doing some of their course in the Czech Republic because oh, they wow. went their own holiday. So it doesn't really matter where you are. Um, in the world, we can talk about that later, but but um, it gives you a lot of flexibility if you don't have to be here. Um, likewise, some people learn better in person, so you know that helps them. And sometimes uh, I will recommend to somebody that that they come in because it's if they're learning how to use an iPhone and they haven't used a touchscreen before and they're learning about gestures, it, it can be tricky teaching that over the phone mm -hmm. you know yeah, yeah. Uh, especially if you're trying to learn on the phone that we're talking on at the time so um <laughs> yes. it can get to be a little bit tricky so sometimes i will say look i strongly recommend that we work out a way that you come in person uh, or i'll say to a person you know what you concentrate better when you're by yourself how about trying this from home mm. what is the cost to attend this program and i guess it depends on how many courses you're taking? Yeah, so I can I can talk about that a little bit. Jill might actually have a better idea than I would, only because uh, I don't get in. We're we're pretty we, we sort of stay in our lane here, so I know you know a lot about the instructing end of things, but I don't know about the financial aid 
end of it as much, but I can tell you what I do know. And Jill can call me a liar if she, if she wants to, or from whatever you remember. <laughs> but um, my perception is that a course here, which uh, is about four months long and is about 96 hours, runs somewhere in the neighborhood of $400. But I've been saying that for the last six years, and surely inflation has happened or something that makes it no longer $400. So don't quote me on that, but I think that's probably a guideline. However, uh, before anybody gets scared and thinks that could be out of reach for some folks, um, there are aid programs available. So if you qualify, there's something called the Adult Upgrading Grant that will pay for up to uh, about three courses at a time, uh, depending on a few different things like your financial status and uh, different things like that. But um, you can uh, get it paid for. Um, if you're Indigenous, I know oftentimes the band offices can find funding for that. So there are different ways of, of getting funding. Uh, and I think there are some bursary programs and scholarships as well. So um, there are ways to cover it off. But yeah, it's, it's about somewhere in the neighborhood of $400 a course. Somebody can take, I think most people take two courses, but you could take up to three realistically with the amount of time there is per week. And a course uh, over the four month period works out to about 96 hours on average um, that you'd need to put into it. Um, and that's a mix of in-person and, you know, going off and doing homework and working on assignments. But that's really what the price is. Uh, it could differ if you're an international student, um, but certainly that's what the price would be. Uh, I would have originally said for for British Columbians, but now that we do things at a distance, there's nothing stopping you from taking this anywhere in Canada or or really the world, but you may be paying international fees at that point. Yeah, that's really exciting that you could you can have students from outside of the lower mainland or Vancouver now. Uh, is there a wait list? Like, I feel like when this podcast airs, you might get flooded. <laughs> So there is no wait list uh, at the moment, and you can thank COVID for that because uh, I think we're not unique. Like I think universities and colleges um, are all down in enrollment at the moment because I think people are sort of figuring out what normal is and they're figuring, I mean, some people won't know that we're open. I mean, we do our best to, to market ourselves. Thanks to Blind Beginnings in this podcast, that's part of that. But we you know, I don't think some people know we're back. And I don't mm -hmm. think some people, you know, are ready to find us yet. So I think I think that's still going to happen. But yeah, we don't have a waiting list at the moment. So if you're interested in, in checking us out, then yeah, that's that's one thing you can do and um, probably get a, a get on pretty quick. Our intakes happen at the beginning of the month. And we do take uh, July and August off. Uh, and half of December, usually the second half, um, is non-teaching, so or non-learning. I should say it from the other perspective. Um, and so, um, but any of those other months, uh, somebody can can sign up and kind of, as long as their paperwork and registration gets all dealt with, then they can sort of start on the first of the, you know, the the first available month after they register. Is there any other program like this that you're aware of? anywhere else? Not in Canada. Um, it's a little bit. So there are some overlap, right there. The CNIB, for example, does teach a little bit of assistive technology. It's not, I don't think as formalized as, as this is and as structured and, you know, even with four month long courses, uh, the Pacific, what, what am I going to call that? The, the training center in Victoria? Right. Yeah, Pacific Training Center. Pacific Training Center. Yeah. So they they also have courses. So I think I think there's a various organizations and and systems in place that provide training and, and courses, but I think all of us have slightly different focuses and and the courses are different. Like ours are very structured and very in depth, and I can't speak to the others. They may be too, um, but um, you know we're not a drop in. We don't just help somebody with their iPhone for half an hour and then they leave. Like if you're going to learn how to use your iPhone with voiceover here in our course, you're going to learn it quite thoroughly by the time you're finished. Um, and certainly in Canada, we're the only uh, public institution that I'm aware of that has a department that's focused specifically on vision impairment 
and assistive technology. Um, but there are other places in, in the world that, you know, um, do a little bit about, you know, a little bit of this, um, you know, the Royal National College for the Blind in the UK has courses similar to what we do. Uh, I think the NFB has some centers in the US that are similar, but we're certainly the only one that I'm aware of in Canada. How did you, how did you find yourself in this role? What, what brought you to, to be an instructor at VCC? Well, I didn't grow up wishing I was an instructor at VCC. Uh, I'm not disappointed that I've become one, but it wasn't my goal. Um, I had a background in assistive technology. So I started off as an assist, as the assistive technologist, uh, for UBC. So the university of British Columbia, and I did that for a few years. And then I became um, an assistive technologist uh, in Scotland for the Scottish government. And my job was to teach people how to become assistive technologists. So I worked with 15 universities and probably about 25 further education colleges and uh, taught people in all of those institutions um, how to become uh, an assistive technologist. So that that was uh, basically a, a, they call it an HND there. So, so um, which is the equivalent of the first and second year of universities here in a, for a bachelor's degree. So um, I helped develop that program and then I taught on that program. And then I'd also have to do a lot of assessments um, for, for students uh, in the UK. And so I did all of that. Uh, and then I stepped away from it for a little while and became uh, a product manager. Um, you guys might remember the program Talks um, that was uh, made for Symbian uh, f- uh, cell phones, um, and it made them speak. So it was a screen reader for for Symbian. Uh, I was the product manager for for that application for a few years while it still existed because um, it aged out through technology obsolescence. Um, thanks to Steve Jobs and the iPhone, which um, is a good thing now, um, but I probably didn't think so at the time. Um, and then it, uh, it came time for me to get out of assistive technology for a year or two, and I became a, uh, I, I ran my own business. I had my own consultancy and um, dealt with non-assistive technology stuff. So I was, uh, I have a, a a bit of a background in network engineering. So I, I was I was doing network engineering for various companies. And uh, that gave me the flexibility to think, hmm, I want to move back to Canada. So I did that. And then when I was back here, I was still running my consultancy, but sort of trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And thanks in part to you, Sean, uh, who heard about a temporary substitute teaching role at VCC, um, that I applied for, um, I landed it and, uh, the person I replaced, uh, didn't come back. So I didn't leave and I'm still here. <laughs> awesome. permanently now though. So I don't have to wonder every four months if mm. I'm still going to be an instructor, but, but I like it. So, so it's my first time working with, um, students that are blind. Uh, so I did that at UBC and I did that to a certain extent in Scotland, but it's the first time I sort of had a structured way of doing that day in and day out. Um, and, and I like it because it's, it's challenging. The technology isn't challenging for me at all, but figuring out the best way to present that to a student and help them learn. And then even the reward I get and Jill, I'll, I'll, you know, I, I follow your progress, right? And, <laughs> and I know that you've, you know, now got your degree sorted out and, and um, you know, did well. And look, I probably didn't play a very big role in that at all. But even if I played a whisker of a role in that, then and I do that for everyone, then, then that makes, that's rewarding, right? Everybody finds mm-hmm. that when they help people out to a certain degree, uh, it's rewarding or just to even... I like the light bulb moments. Like if I'm sitting there with a student and they're getting frustrated because they, they don't know how to do something. I was working with a student today who was um, asking me about Braille and they're having trouble reading the letters. So like identifying, they're, they're having trouble with G's and H's and F's and D's, right? And he's just, just like, I'm super frustrated. Like how, what, 
what can you suggest? And I said, well, you know what? Just do what I do. Guess, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and he's just like, guess. And I'm like, yeah, that's not very scientific. <laughs> but if you're reading a word and it's facade, it's not likely gasad or hasad, you know? <laughs> so if you think it could be one of three letters, pick the one that makes the most sense mm. and keep going. Mm -hmm. And you just like, cha-ching, like that makes sense. And you know, <laughs> even that's a small reward. So uh that's that's why that's that's why i like it when i was there and this was five years ago now i don't believe at the time when i was there that um like ios and mac like so iphones macs tablets but i don't think of any kind where or even android or anything like that was being taught it was mainly from what i understood pcs with jaws and like braille and i know later on that you guys kind of incorporated that more and more into like the like different structures in the courses like did you find having more of the that accessible technology added on was that like kind of a big uptake in like how much you had to do and like you had to relearn it so so really what what we've had to do is is keep up with the times so you know um i don't know when they made this decision but let's say back in the mid 80s so they I, they wouldn't have been using jaws then because JAWS for Windows only really came out in 95, and then it was only really usable from 97 onwards. So, um, you know, it would have evolved with the times, and, and we've just kept doing that. So over the past few years, NVDA has gotten to a point where it's no longer a niche third-rate screen reader. It's, it's very viable, um, and, and it competes very well with JAWS. Um, and it's very affordable, especially for students in that it's free. So uh -uh. Um, we had to, uh, and I, I tend to, you know, be up on a lot of this stuff. So I thought, well, we better get NVDA going because we have some demand. And, and, and I think that if we offered it, then we'd have even more demand. And, and that's been the case. So, so now what we, we tend to do is anything that would work with JAWS before. So whether it's, you know, learning how to use Windows 10, or Windows 11 with JAWS, uh, or Microsoft Word, or PowerPoint, or Excel, or Outlook, or Chrome, or Firefox. I was going to say Internet Explorer, but luckily we've we've retired that one. Um, but we also make those same courses available using NVDA. So um, we now you know do that too. And I, like I said, I came from the mobile phone industry, so. Personally speaking, I, I love using cell phone technology and it, it just becomes more and more important to be proficient using a cell phone when you're accessing information, like whether you're using a phone just to send texts or phone calls or emails. But for us, it's so much more, right? Like what if we want to read a bus stop with seeing AI or, or you know, a, a sign, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a crucial tool. So I thought, well, we better we better develop a course um, using iOS. So we did that and um, it's been a, probably one of our most popular courses. And I think yeah. it's been now running probably for about four or five years. I don't quite remember now, but um, because it's changed a little bit as the versions changed, I have to change the course as well. But yeah. um, so we do that. And then I also created a uh, course because once people started to know how to use their iPhones, then they started some people, and Jill, I think you're one of these people, you started to enjoy what the Mac or what the Apple sort of universe had to offer. So a lot of people mm -hmm. are moving into Macs. So then I thought, well, I guess I better teach people how to use Macs. So mm -hmm. developed a course on how to use Mac OS with voiceover. And so we've had a few people take that. It's, it's actually not been as popular as I thought it would be, but oh, now that I broadcast it, maybe it will be. <laughs> um, and I've, I've also developed a course um, via, with Android and TalkBack, um, okay. but it's still in the sort of um, me working on it phase. So it's not oh. really ready for, for public consumption, um, but a lot of it has to do with demand. So if like 50 people came to me in two weeks and said, we'd like an Android course, then I would uh, be spending all of my professional development time developing an Android course. Um, and we would try to have that ready as quickly as possible. So we do try to keep up with technology yeah. and sort of with the trends um, as best as possible, which, which is tricky, right? Because mm -hmm. we're limited to 
how the college is. So if, if everybody here remembers the college or university they attended, while colleges and universities like to think that they're on the forefront of technology, how much new technology did you ever see in your classrooms or anywhere at the university or college, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't brand new most of the time. So we're also, you know, stuck with whatever we have here. So we're now to a point where, okay, we have Windows 10 on all our computers here, but I now have distance students saying, well, that's great. But on my home computer, we have Windows 11. Mm -hmm. And so, so that can be, you know, a little bit challenging as well, but we do have to sort of keep up with technology as, as best as possible. And, and we try to do that. Another question I had too, are the courses you do with like the different you know types of computers, like JAWS, NVDA, VoiceOver, Mac, is it kind of just the basics of how to navigate or as like the lessons of the program of that device kind of progress, does it go more into like the certain applications? Like, so do you guys kind of go into those certain features of the device, like the certain apps as well? Or is it more just general navigation? Yeah, so like I said, we've we've initially we focused exclusively on PC applications. So kind of the way that the pathway works is that I like to suggest to a student, and, and our courses do have prerequisites. Yeah, they're usually attainable prerequisites. It's not like you need a PhD in something or anything like that. But <laughs> But so, for example, um, keyboarding is the first thing you need to learn. And I'm going to answer your question here. Just let me go through the, <laughs> the, the progress here so it makes sense, right? So mm -hmm. at first, if somebody doesn't know how to type, we, we, we teach them basic keyboarding. Uh, so they learn their way around the, the keyboard and can learn how to touch type. Then once they've sort of mastered that, um, and they're sort of moving more into the, the using computer courses, um, the first course that that usually is necessary for somebody to take is is let's say windows uh with jaws or windows with nvda and now to sort of answer your question there's two parts of that so part of it is the, the course tries to teach the operating system windows itself and everything that goes along with that but at the same time it's trying to teach you how to use let's just say jaws with that right so you're learning a little bit of JAWS and a little bit of Windows. And then the next lesson, um, like, so the first lesson, for example, might deal with the desktop and JAWS. So you'll learn a few of the commands that JAWS needs to use when you're navigating through the desktop. And then the next lesson might deal with the start menu. And so then you learn this, how the start menu is structured and what JAWS commands you use to navigate the start menu. And then the taskbar, and it just keeps building and building and building. So you're sort of learning how to use your screen reader at the time, the same time as learning how to use the operating system. And that same philosophy holds true when you're getting into specific applications. Mm -hmm. So will our Microsoft Word course teach you how to be a publisher and like, you know, perfect at Microsoft Word? Probably not, but I bet you'll know more than the person sitting beside you on the bus um, because we do go into a, a lot more detail than I ever went into when I was learning how to use applications. So, so we do teach the application to a fairly advanced level and the screen reader goes along with that. Um, and that holds true with um, NVDA, with the PC apps, um, with, with the Mac and with, uh, so the way it works on the Mac right now, we just sort of keep that like we would our Windows with JAWS or our Windows with NVDA. So we just have Mac OS with VoiceOver. And that's because it's relatively new. It's still an infant course. So by that, I mean, it's only been around for a couple of years and we haven't had a lot of people expressing interest in pages or numbers or anything that we need to sort of write a more advanced course in. I mean, I will if we will, if there's demand. Um, but for now, uh, it's just that. And, and honestly, the same with the iOS course. So the way I usually uh, work for that course is there's a 24 lessons that that a student takes for the iOS course. And so what I always say is, if you finish those early, and oh. you're like at the three and a half month mark, or I shouldn't say that it's always four months, if students need to take eight months to do it, like two course blocks, they can do oh. that as well. So there's, there's various limitations, but that more depends on funding, etc. But you can take as long as you need to 
uh, within reason for courses. So I will always say to a student, okay, well, we have two weeks left. I'm not just going to tell you to sit down and count the minutes by until May comes, you know, I'm going to say like, is there anything you want to learn? Like, is there anything that you could learn on this device that's going to improve your job prospects or your education prospects or improve your life in a certain way? And I'm like, let's, let's do it. Cause, uh, you've got some time left and, uh, I'm willing to help as best as possible. So what we often do for that is, uh, a lot of people are interested in sat nav applications or, um, seeing AI is a big one. Sounds amazing. I feel like there's something for everybody. If somebody wants to find out more information or they want to register, how, where, where do they go? What do they do? Yep. So there's various ways, uh, Probably the easiest way, if you don't remember anything I'm saying right now, is to simply type in VCC visually impaired into your search engine of choice, and you will hopefully come up with us as your first or second hit. Uh, uh, let's just say first, because I don't know what it would be if, if we weren't first. <laughs> um, and you can sort of find us through the website. Um, it's sort of a two-part process. You need to register as a student uh, at VCC, and then and then so you need to apply to VCC and then sort of the next step after that is to apply and enroll in our program and you can find links to that on that main website uh, you could also phone us and our phone number gets you through to the main VCC switchboard 604-871-7000 and you just ask for the visually impaired program and they will direct you to our department and somebody will help answer your questions and direct you where to go. Uh, incidentally, VCC is also very good at helping people find funding sources and help you fill out those forms. So if we all remember back to being a student, if you're applying for any kind of funding, what a nightmare that was. Uh, that hasn't changed over the years, by the way. It's still a nightmare. There's a lot of paperwork and everything else. So we have people that will help uh, people with uh, filling out the paperwork um, for just just general navigation reasons. And also if you have trouble filling in paperwork, then we'll help you with that. And uh, that's probably the best way to do that. So I don't think uh, I said our website. So if you'd want to just go directly to our website, it's www.vcc.ca. Awesome. Thank you so much, Monty, for being here today and sharing all of this. It's a great program. I really need to learn PowerPoint. It's my goal for the year. So I might be, uh, might be your student soon. We'll keep, <laughs> a, we'll keep a workstation open for you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Jill, for being yeah, here. I'm thinking about going back and learning possibly Excel for future publishing stuff. So awesome. yeah. And I'll cool. also be back soon. Maybe I'll see you there. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast. If you have a question, a comment, a future topic request, please send us an email to limitless at blindbeginnings.ca. Please share our podcast, like, subscribe, leave us a rating, and join us next time. This podcast has been brought to you by Blind Beginnings, an organization based in Vancouver, Canada, that supports children and youth who are blind or partially sighted, along with their families. Music for this podcast is composed by Sean Bishop and Clement Chow. Production and audio editing by Rob Minot. For more information about Blind Beginnings and the work it does to support children and youth who are blind and partially sighted, along with their families, visit us on the web at www.blindbeginnings.ca. And also remember to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time.